there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I certainly can. My name's Dr. Trish Lee, and it's just D R T R I S H L E I G H at gmail.com. And I would be happy to send you the slides if you would like them. I'm recording it if I don't keep walking out of the screenshot so that I can put it on my YouTube channel so that it would be available afterwards for you. And Guy and I have. Uh, Guy has graciously wanted me to share with you that we're going to be doing a webinar that's more extensive within the next month, hopefully, who knows with the holidays, but sometime soon so that I can get into greater detail with the quick pearls that I'm going to give you today. But uh, to start off, and honestly, these three presentations this morning couldn't have been planned better. And I didn't know what Melissa was going to talk about, and David, I haven't even met them until today. But I could go back and talk about so many things that they started to talk about that then I feel like I'm going to expand upon now. And the first thing is our program, and I'm going to tell you about the program at the end. It's an educational program where I teach you how to do all of the things I'm going to tell you today. But our program is called Neurofeedback Experts, and it is deliberately named that because I want all of us to feel like neurofeedback experts, and David just said that. So how long does it take to become an expert? Who knows this? 10,000 hours. So you've probably heard that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert, and that notion was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in a book called Outliers. And you can see it up here, eight hours a day, five days a week, 44 weeks a year for five and a half years. So Malcolm Gladwell says it takes that long, and it's based on a study, and I'm gonna share the study with you in a minute. But you need 10,000 hours to become a neurofeedback expert. So thankfully, I have that 10,000 hours that I have put into this program to share with you. Uh, so, the next thought is, you say it takes 10,000 hours to become a master or an expert, the training they're going to give me is four hours. What does that make me? <coughs> so, I'd like you to think about how much training you have. And it's going to vary for different people because some people have just joined Brain Corps and some people have been around for a long time. But, the truth is, and I'm surprised nobody has mentioned this or, you know, shot up when we said 10,000 hours is that this has actually been debunked. It's not 10,000 hours, and I'm gonna tell you what it is in just a minute, but first I wanna tell you my story about how I became a Brain Corps family member and how my journey transpired after that. So, true story, five years ago I joined Brain Corps. I basically strong-armed Guy into making, allowing me to come to a training one week after I decided I wanted to do that. It was the first time we met, I called him like, Guy, my name's Trish Lee. I need to come down for the training. Oh, we're full. I'm like, please, I need you to make room because I need to do this thing. So before that, I have been a college professor for almost 20 years. I am not a chiropractor. I have two PhDs. One is in the area of cognitive and communicative development and degeneration. So thinking about how people think and communicate across the lifespan from birth to death, basically. And the second is in cognitive science, which is brain functioning. So then I also have a couple master's degrees. If I tell you about all my training, you'll know exactly how my brain functions. So I won't tell you all of that, but I have a master's in educational leadership too. I've always worked with children. I've always worked with adults too, but basically, you know, I've worked with people with head injury, kids with every type of learning, uh, delay, uh, disorder, difficulties. I work with people with stroke, with motor, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, you know, you, you name it. I've worked with it over the last 25 years. I'm licensed as a speech language pathologist too. So long story short, I get my brain core system. I'm totally psyched because as you know, neurofeedback's awesome. I get back home. I convince my husband who is a chiropractor to let me have a room in his office. Uh, and we had moved, so I was a tenured college professor, but I was setting our family up in our new town of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We have six children, so that is not an easy task. <laughs> 
So I got everybody set up. We got the chiropractic office set up. I get my new room. I get my neurofeedback system. I'm psyched. And then I'm ready to rock and roll. There's only one problem. I don't have any patience. All I hear is crickets. And I feel like I, you know, I'm like, I can convert some chiropractic patients, get this thing rolling. I mean, this system's awesome. I'm totally educated. I'm gonna get these people in. It did not work. So I, if anybody knows me, I'm very solution oriented. So that would, did not happen for long. I got a couple patients, recommended 20 sessions. They would kind of come and go. So I knew I had to put a system together that would attract the right patients for me. It would keep them in care and it would move them through a beautiful process so they referred more people. So my goal wasn't lead generation. My goal was to build a bigger practice over time. We've been doing it for five years and thankfully we've been very successful. And with the growth trajectory, you know, I envision it getting bigger and bigger and bigger and using some of the tools that David and Melissa have talked about. But what I'm gonna show you is how we did that. And that's what we're gonna get into. But now we're gonna debunk the 10,000 hour rule. So the 10,000 hour study was based on violinists in the Music Academy of Berlin. And what they did was they studied expert level violin players and what made them different than the good and the not so good. And the thing that made the cream of the crop rise was 10,000 hours of deliberate practice of that skill, in particular playing the violin. This study has been replicated with many people or with many different types of skills. But what's the problem with that? That's one skill. That's violin playing. So the debunking of this myth, unfortunately for all of us, most highly applies to entrepreneurs because you can do neurofeedback for 10,000 hours and really be great at neurofeedback, but that doesn't mean you're gonna fill your office. So the reality is, unfortunately, it's 80,000 hours. <laughs> I am sorry to tell you that. So, okay, this is a true story too. I'm in my new neurofeedback room, totally psyched, by myself, annoyed. So I hire myself a business coach to like figure this thing out with me, you know? He tells me, and if you work with this gentleman and he's told you this too, please don't tell me because it's really worked well for me, okay? He told me, like, get out of your own way. He kept telling me I'm the only gas station on the island. And what he meant by that is, I actually have this 80,000 hours of experience in all of these areas. And so I'm thinking about this. I used to own restaurants. I had three restaurants that I ran. So I had to do all of our pricing. I had to do all of our food costs. I did all of that for a long time. I had to do all of our advertising to get people in the door. I had to do all that and it worked great. Our restaurants were, crank were cranking before we left. So the idea is it's 80,000 hours and we're gonna break each one of these down right now. But basically what it is, is it's the psychology of purchasing. There is a psychology of purchasing. If you don't know about it, you need to know about it. And I'm gonna tell you one or two things today. Marketing, which we've talked about a little bit, and it's research-driven marketing in my mind. Customer relationship management, and that's really what we're talking about. And that's what Melissa was talking about too. Building relationships with people before you even meet them, and then having people want to come to your office to see you. And, and to be in your office. And I'm actually never in our office anymore. So it's really not about seeing me, it's just about being around our nests, I guess. So my husband's in the office, and really I probably go in, I think like eight hours a week now, and I'm home with our kids full time, basically. You need to know how to create programs, and I'm gonna tell you quickly. You need proven pricing models, and I spent tons of time figuring this out, and these models feel great to me, and honestly, they could probably be higher, and they will be eventually in our practice, but they are priced perfectly high, and I'm gonna tell you in just a minute. Office processes, this is the most important part, and David actually skimmed this idea too when he said he'll look at your office and see if you have tight systems in place to be a good candidate for lead generation. Because the reality is, if you get a million leads and you don't have a tight process, you are wasting money on getting them in the office. You need to spend your dough wisely. 
And honestly, if you take this program with me, I didn't use any money for marketing at the beginning because you know this adage, when you start, you have time and not money. I use my time. Then, as you have less time, you use your money, and that's what we teach you to do. Progress tracking using data. Who uses really tight data to show people progress in their office? Anybody feel like you're doing that? Tight data analysis and showing progression of improvement over time is the key to success. And I'll show you how in just a minute. And paperwork. So all the paperwork, and David said this too, deliberate paperwork. The paperwork is not really even for me. It is for the people that I'm working with. We've created all of this paperwork that works beautifully. And in our course, you just get all the paperwork so that you can just use it too. Okay, so let's get into it. So I'm sitting in my neurofeedback room feeling like a schmo, even though I really should be rocking this thing out. And it occurred to me, yeah, I, need, I have all that 80,000 hours, but the thing that I am lacking right now, there's two things. I'm lacking confidence, even though I should be confident, and all of you should too, I'm lacking confidence. I don't feel like I can sit across from a person and look them directly in the eyes and share about neurofeedback and outcomes and things like that. And the second thing was communication, which David also talked about. I am a scientist. I, before we left, I was researching and studying and using neurotherapies in my role as a university professor. So unfortunately, I'm very scientific when I talk about things. I talk way over people's levels, but as a college professor, I had to learn how to share that information with people. And I, again, I totally forgot that when I you know, went into private practice. So when I broke it down and use really clear salient, and that's what David's talking about. Saliency is meaningful and relevant to each and every person you're in communication with. When I started doing that, I, re you know, I was full force going ahead and we were rocking and rolling. And this is a little different. I love, talk, uh, love listening to Richard talk. You know, he's awesome to listen to and he shows the brain maps. But something that's really important for us is we have to help people invest in this, invest their money. So it's one thing showing them what's going on and it's another thing, you know, moving them through the journey so they're willing to pay money for it. And that's what being a neurofeedback expert is about. So it's having an expert mindset, following systematic programs that are proven to work, having confidence and fun, right? It's supposed to be fun. This is life, we're supposed to be having fun doing it. And a motto I use is trying to educate, inspire, and empower people. So it's really about you know, letting people know that this is the most awesome technology in the world and they need to be part of it if they want to you know, move through their journey. What it is not is knowing everything about everything in neurofeedback. I originally felt that way. And that was my first strategy when I'm sitting in my neurofeedback room by myself. I'm like, I need to know everything about everything in neurofeedback. And once I know everything about everything, I'm gonna be good to go. So I bought all the textbooks that Richard's talking about. I took every training, I could get my mitts on, right? I, I took my level of expertise in neurofeedback from here to here because even though I had background in neuroplasticity and brain functioning and, and brains at all different ages across the lifespan, you know, I felt like I really need to know everything about neurofeedback. You don't. And you need to know some real fundamentals, which is basically what Richard was talking about to Mark yesterday. And then you need to know how to communicate that to people. So we call it in our office, the show. And what the show is, it's like Starbucks. The show is you need to provide an awesome cup of coffee to people that they're willing to pay $6 for, and they're willing to drive past 20 other coffee shops to get, because not only is that coffee awesome, they love being in Starbucks. Some light jazz music playing, some spunky little baristas, nice art on the wall, smells like coffee. They like being at Starbucks. When people come to our office, they know that they're going to get the highest level care and they're willing to pay for it, just like Starbucks coffee, and they're going to get an awesome experience. And I equate this back to the restaurant. Last night we went to a restaurant called the Sage Room. It was, thankfully, the universe led the way for us because they had no tables, but then they called someone who was late and they weren't coming. 
So a beautiful table opened up for us. We had awesome food, nice lighting. It cost, you know, it cost a decent amount of money, but I'm okay with that. I have six children that are probably destroying my house right now because my husband has come with me. This is the first time we've we said this is the first time we've been alone in 17 years. We went away one other time to Key West for like, t I know we're here. We're having the best time too. We said we're going to buy one of everything. We're like totally psyched to be here. So that's why we don't get out that much. Thankfully, they're entering the teen years now, uh, you know, where we had to have the talk. Do not do anything illegal. Do not do anything frowned upon. But uh, so spending money in a really beautiful restaurant experience for us is worth it. And that's what we were happy to do and we really enjoyed our time, right? Okay, psychology of purchasing. This is the first, these are the eight keys for permanent success. So it is not about getting people in and you know trying to convert them. It is about building your practice over time. And again, David said that too. Is this gonna work overnight? No, but it's gonna start to work overnight. That's the truth. My program's five weeks long and my goal is for you to Use these little pearls of wisdom to get one person paying a high dollar amount so that your confidence goes up. You feel like a neurofeedback expert and you can put the systems in place over time. So psychology of purchasing, what is it? So there's actually nine mental triggers and I'm not gonna share all of them today. I'm gonna share two of them today with you. Uh, my favorite mental trigger is curiosity. And you know how this works. Curiosity killed the cat, right? So in our office, we only try to get people to want a brain map. And I use very authentic communication, like Melissa was saying, that's why it all just goes together beautifully. You know, the version of me you see here is the version I am everywhere. So when people call, I say, just convince yourself to get the brain map. We charge $5.99 for brain map. So get, you know, convince yourself to get a brain map. It will show you all the information that you wanna know about what is the neurological root behind your son's ADHD? We're not talking about, you don't have to commit right now to 100 neurofeedback sessions, just get the testing. And I've always felt that way, long before mapping, I've always told people, get every test in the world so you know what you're dealing with. Then you can decide what you're going to do about it. And you know, I tell our staff all the time too, these people need us more than we need them. Remember that. So when we're authentically communicating with them, it's not to get them in for us it's to get them out of their own way so that we can help them. So one trigger is curiosity. Make them want to know what their map says. And we use these triggers and I'm jumping down, but you know, when do we use these triggers? All the time. We use all nine of them spread across every single step in our process so that people just want to know what the next thing is. And it happens all the time. It happened on Friday. We were late. And my husband wanted me to put our schedule up because our schedule is perfectly busy. It's super fun to do, but we had three brain maps, two report of findings, a full neurofeedback schedule, a full <laughs> chiropractic schedule, and my husband does spinal decompression too, so we had a full spinal decompression schedule. But my point about that was I was in one of the report of findings and the mom's like, we need to get the maps for us and for our three other kids. And you should have seen the dad like, whoa, slow down here, you know, to his wife, like, let's just get through the report of findings for our son. But she's like, I need to know what my map says. And he's looking at her like, but you know, she already wants to know. And then she's already asked me, do you have family discounts? Why, yes we do, you know, can, to treat the whole family. She wants to know, and then she wants to know if it can help, if neurofeedback can help her too. That's one of the mental triggers, curiosity. Another mental trigger is social proof. So what's social proof? It is showing people that you're not the only person in the world doing neurofeedback. And a way that I do it and that you can do it tomorrow is Harvard University on their Science in the News website. If you Google Science in the News, Harvard University, ADHD, you'll end up at the website that has a beautiful article written by a neuroscientist who says that neurofeedback is the wave of the future and unfortunately she says in treating psychiatric disorders which she considers ADHD don't even get me started it's a conversation for a different day they're neurological disorders and if you join me in the neurofeedback expert program I will quickly and easily show you that they are neurological disorders with behavioral symptoms so but again conversation for a different day but anyways the article, if you send your people there, then you're showing 
Harvard says this is the most awesome thing to do for ADHD, anxiety, depression. So it's not you going, you know what, I think you should really do this. This is super cool. Harvard University says you should do this. This is super cool. And we do it in other ways too. But that's what social proof is. So now you're using these mental triggers all along the way to get people out of the way. Why do we use them? We use them to illuminate the gap. And David was talking about the gap to you. What is the gap? The gap is a person's journey. It is where they are now and where they want to be. So they have to tell you, but, and I will be honest with you, I don't really listen to people for very long and, and I don't really talk to them at all except for using my steps because I don't want to, if you know how this goes, tell me what's going on with you. You're there forever. They'll go, okay, when I was born, 42 years ago, like, no, 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 no. So what I do is give, I say to people, and actually my husband does this part, in one minute, tell me what's going on with you. And they tell us for one minute, and we already have paperwork, so we already know. We can, I, and we'll reiterate it back to them using the information we have. In one minute, tell me what's going on so that then we can use the mental triggers to make them want to know what their map is going to say about what they just told us is going on. It's all very deliberate and it's very quick. So if you're spending lots of time listening to people's woes, you can use this process to just speed it all up because you're saying the right things. You don't have to listen to a half hour. And if you have a big neurofeedback practice, you will know that the people it attracts really wanna tell you what their deal is because they're used to doing that. All the other solutions that they've had involve telling the practitioner their life story and we've actually have a, oh, sorry, my husband's telling me to get in the camera shot. Uh, we actually have a psychologist who, who has joined us in our practice. We brought her on deliberately. So if people want to do that, you're welcome to go do that in that, in that appropriate um, scenario. Okay, but we have to illuminate the gap. And the reason we have to do that is because we have to sell them a program. We are not selling cars here, people, right? That is the, the bottom line is, when people go to buy a car, they know what they want. They want a car. So they might look at their options and how many doors and how big, how small. When people are suffering with ADHD or anxiety or everything in between, they don't know about neurofeedback in 99 out of 100 cases. All they know is what problem they have and what they don't want, what hasn't worked. They don't want medication. And those are the people we market to, people who don't want medication, people who have done CBT therapy for five years and it's not working. The reason it's not working is because their brain is jammed in a gear. We unjam your brain and CBT is going to work. Actually, all your past CBT might work. You might not even need new CBT if your brain's in a better spot. So we have to show them what we have to offer and we have to educate them inspire them and empower them at the beginning and through the journey and we show you all the ways to do that we use the triggers everywhere we use them with love so when we communicate with people it is for their their sake it is not for our sake we are using these triggers to help them and if you've ever bought anything maybe you bought something here this weekend because they were pulling on the psychological triggers that made you think uh like yesterday financial you know, the stocks. I'm like, I gotta do that. It's so fun. We got six kids. It'll be perfect for us. Like, I'm like, I am being worked right now. And I love it because it is the psychological trigger. So I, when I purchase things, I love knowing that it just worked on me because it's a thing I want. And I don't know if I want to spend $4,000 on it, but I want it and I'm going to value it. Okay. Who do we use it with? My ideal customer avatar, ICA, we help you identify this in the first module. If you don't know who this is right now, you need to identify your ideal customer avatar. So my ideal customer avatar are people with ADHD and anxiety. And honestly, I would recommend that for you unless you have a niche that you love. And the reason I chose ADHD and anxiety is because ADHD is down here on the continuum of brain maps and brain patterns. Anxiety is up here. So ADHD is much too much slow brain processing speed. Anxiety is much too much fast speed. And actually Richard showed you this yesterday in lots of maps, they generally happen together. So if you market to ADHD and anxiety, 
first of all, you're going to attract a huge population. And second of all, you're going to attract everybody in between. But if you appeal to everyone, you actually then are not attracting anyone. So you need to niche it down to who you want to work with. And actually we have a new niche, so we've been working this niche, is tinnitus. So my undergrad degree is also in audiology, so I feel really great about that. We help people, and I will share this with you in the program, the way to help tinnitus is so easy. And people get better and they stay better and there's nothing else that can help them. Neurofeedback is the only thing. So we love it. We go to audiologists, we tell them, we've got the solution for you. And audiologists refer to us and it's become a bigger niche. And now that I'm not really in the practice that much, I love working with children. My husband's more of an adult kind of guy, so we're attracting more adults. Our, our practice has really shifted. We have a lot of everybody, but it's shifted from primarily kids with learning challenges to adults with anxiety and then with tinnitus. We treat a lot of misophonia. If you don't even know what that is, go look it up. And if you join us in the program, I will teach you about that. Uh, so another thing is I am my avatar. So like if you're an athlete and you love peak performance in sports, track more of that. You know, I'm a stressed out mom of six kids that all have different brains, right? I'm thankful I'm not that stressed out. But we attract a lot of people who have anxiety because of an overstuffed lifestyle. And I'm hugely at risk for that. And actually neurofeedback has probably saved my life in that department. And we have lots of kids that have all different types of needs. So we attract those people because that's what we are. So if you're into athletics, attract athletes. You can rock that out. You can have a huge athletic practice. You know, if you really love working with people with neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, movement disorders, if you're a pain person, you're used to being in the market of pain, go for it. Neurofeedback is amazing for pain. And again, if you don't know that, I can help you see that. Everything I do is based on science. So every week I read the articles, research articles on brain functioning and neurofeedback. And like, I think it was Richard who said, there's not that many studies on neurofeedback. If you have a scientific mind and you've been trained to do this, you can fill in the gaps because there's tons of studies that show that all of these disorders and difficulties are caused by neurological dysregulation. It, they're neurological disorders. So once you know that, you know, you sit taller because you're like, I can totally, there might not be a neurofeedback study, but if, and if you look, our, our practice is called Lee Brain and Spine. If you go to our practice website, there's a science tab where I've been trying to accumulate the science and I have it organized under different categories, neurological disorders, even though they all are sensory processing disorders, cognitive disorders. The science is there, the research articles. Uh, and one mom, I gave her an article and she's like, is this boring? I'm like, it's about brain functioning. I don't know what to tell you. Like, I don't think it's boring, but you might. I share the abstracts with people, and nowadays I just send them to my website. But the articles that are there that says sensory processing disorder is hypoactivity combined with hyperactivity in the sensory motor cortex. New article just came out three days ago on dyslexia, which of course I've known this for a long time, and there's been other smaller things that say that dyslexia is three areas of the brain that are hypoactive and one area that's hyperactive. So you know what that means to me? I look for those areas in the brain map. I train those areas with neurofeedback. I produce awesome outcomes for people. So, you know, the point is that we wanna attract those people that we know we can help and that we love helping. Uh, and you have to, you know, you can't appeal to everyone. And I really liked what Richard said yesterday too, when someone asked him a question about seizure disorder. He's like, I don't really know because I don't treat seizure disorder. You know, it's hard to be an expert at everything. So we want to give you easy expert level skills in the things that you care about. Okay, research driven marketing that's proving to convert. If you did not know that it takes eight different exposures for someone to care about you and your service, then that's bad news for you. If you think you're gonna be in front of person, a person one time and they're gonna come in and pay you $10,000, that rarely happens, it does happen, but it happens rarely. You need to get in front of them eight different times and usually eight different ways. And like I told you, everything we use for our office really doesn't cost a lot of money. Because I started doing it that way when I made this neurofeedback expert program or when I accidentally made it, and it works. So I keep doing that without spending a ton of money. 
Um, there are seven proven steps in marketing that, and they all have action steps underneath them. So if you are actually doing one action step in these seven categories, and I share this in our neurofeedback expert program, and if you want, you can just Google seven steps in marketing and there'll be a chart you can peek at, but we show you specifically how to use the steps and the actual action steps to implement in each of these seven areas. If you actually use them, what it does is it continues to propel you in a successful direction over time. One thing we do using eight different exposures and using these seven steps is I've created a community awareness calendar of just easy things and honestly we're very busy so it's not like we're out there really you know working hard and be doing workshops and things like that we're not we do very deliberate community awareness calendar so for example October's ADHD awareness month I don't know if anybody's aware of that but it's ADHD awareness month so for the last five years I've been using ADHD awareness month as a community awareness tool and usually what I do is I pick one or two offices because that's all, that's my capacity as a busy person that I can go and talk to them about the utility of brain mapping because I want people to know what their maps say. And then I, you know, give them a little bit about neurofeedback and, the, and we have email scripts that you can use to do this. And I've helped other offices do this, but you use the email script to basically get the offices to let you come there and do a workshop. So tomorrow, of course, tomorrow I'm doing a workshop for a large therapy company that has 20 therapists, occupational, physical, speech therapists. You should do this if you're not doing that. You know why therapists are a good place for you to go into the community to talk? Is because most therapy is covered by insurance, so you're not at risk of taking out of their pockets. Because anybody you're at risk of taking money out of their pocket to put it in yours, they don't love collaborating with you, but places that you're not doing that do like collaborating with you. So therapy um, companies are a really great start and every kid there needs neurofeedback is the reality. So tomorrow I'm doing a quick workshop. When I do the workshop, then the next step is for, I offer a free webinar for their families. So, and again, we've heard this twice from Melissa and David, you have to give. So I give them a little bit of education and inspiration, empower them to wanna to know more about neurofeedback. And then I also have one other at a pediatrician's office, which is definitely a little more difficult. And honestly, I enjoy going toe to toe with them. So it, you have to have the cojones to, uh, re, you know, they'll dance with you and tell you neurofeedback isn't, you know, proven to be effective, which isn't true. Hopefully all of you know the American Academy of Pediatrics has endorsed neurofeedback as a level one best support since 2012. The American Psychological Association endorses it and there is a boatload of research that shows that it works. Hopefully you all know that the, there is a large meta-analysis that just came out on February 5th by Jessica Van Doren. Look it up, use it as social proof. This meta-analysis showed that this, this is the best part and actually I just had an email discussion with Medical News Today because if you look it up, they wrote a less than great, I'm trying to stay away from this because like Melissa said, stay positive don't get sucked into negative. <laughs> but it really annoyed me. They wrote an article that basically says neurofeedback's too expensive, it really isn't proven to work, but you could try it out if you wanted to. And Dr. Timothy Legg is the one who like, you know, endorsed it as the medical editor. And I wrote the editor, I'm like, you're forgetting about the most recent, you know, article that was published, a large meta-analysis. And they, they wrote back, which was nice, but then I'm like, you know, I gotta stay out of this space, but they forgot to leave that out. And the reason they left it out is because any study that wasn't a randomized clinical trial was taken out of the meta-analysis. So it ended up being a small N, which, you know, I mean, medical area doesn't like that, but for me, I'm like, that's lots of studies. But this is the coolest thing that you can tell people is that the effect size of neurofeedback at post-treatment was medium. At follow-up, it was large. That's how neuroplasticity works. And that's what I wrote back to the editor and he said, thank you for your comments and we will think about our what we write a little bit harder next time. I wrote to him, maybe we should think about this time. That just came out last week. I'm like, maybe we should just add some stuff to that, right? But having an effect size larger, I've been telling people this in my office for a long time. Neurofeedback's gonna work when you're here, it's gonna work better 
later on. And that's what this just proved. Okay, so we do that in community awareness. What is it's, a meta-analysis? A meta-analysis means that they looked at, and I, I'm probably not right when I say every, but a meta-analysis means they looked at all the neurofeedback studies that have been done over time. So they look at lots and lots of studies. That's why it's so powerful, because it's not one study. It's looking at all these studies over time. And if you read it, it's really cool because the training is, you know, basically what Richard said yesterday, it's basically like theta down, beta up. It's not fancy training at all. And that was a real big takeaway for me early on in my practice. We can do some real basic trainings in the right spot and change lives. And that is just true. So this study showed across all these studies with some real easy traditional training, kids and, and adults are getting better over time. So that is, has huge power in my, in my world. So, okay, so, and in marketing, it's all about relationships. So a lot of people say this to me, you're everywhere. I love that, because I'm not everywhere. I've just got some pretty affordable things out in the world, so people are seeing little pieces. Like another thing I've done is um, my daughter's a musician, so they asked me if I'd speak on stage fright and anxiety. Sure, I will. So I had posters up about that. So people will come in, they'll go, I've seen you everywhere. And then a lot of people say to me, and I love this because I think the universe works this way too, I'm meant to be here. I'm meant to work with you. So if someone walks in and they're meant to work with me, I don't have to sell them. They're, they're there to work with me. And that happens all the time. I don't sell one person. I'm just there to provide the service that they have come in because they want it. And it's just really, you know, kind of low level stuff, but you're just doing it in the right way. Uh, and we have people travel, uh, probably the average farness that people travel is five hours away. We have lots of people from Charlotte who come to our office. Um, now, thankfully, we offer home neurofeedback training, much easier to serve people from far away. People from the outer banks come to me. People will pass, like we said about Starbucks, people will pass 25 other neurofeedback clinics to come to ours. And people say it, I, I could go to my office, I could go to my town and get a brain map for $99. But I just feel like I should come to you. I'm like, that's awesome. And we're gonna talk about pricing in just a minute. Okay, customer relationship management. You need systems to educate and inspire. So when it comes down to these little sound bites, if you know what to say in sound bites, we give you the sound bites, by the way. You don't have to create them. You can modify them and make your own if you'd like, but the course that we offer is five modules online. There's lots of videos of me. Um, the average is probably per week, it's about two and a half, three hours of videos. You get all the slides that go with it, handouts, all the paperwork, everything written. But the idea is you just learn how to say these sound bites so that you're not reinventing the wheel. So you have expert level knowledge condensed into sound bites that make people want to work with you. So it's short bursts of information. So if you want to have a takeaway from this slide, don't tell people too much at one time. Give them sound bites. So it, create your own sound bites. Just give them one little nugget. And what is the nugget supposed to do? Create curiosity. All you want to do is get them to the next nugget, and that's how we do it. So we do this in person. Our staff is trained to do it over the phone. They love doing it because they're doing it out of love. They're having a blast. You know, we take control over every conversation in a nice, loving way, and I'll tell you about that in a second. We do it in meetings, we do it in presentations. And one example for you, another takeaway, is in your elevator speech. Now, my elevator speech was awful when I got back home from my brain core training. What do you do? I didn't know what I did, to be honest with you. So I would be like, blah, 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 blah. I was confused by the time I got done telling people. If you don't know what an elevator speech is, it's you tell someone what you do by the time the elevator gets from floor one to floor five. So you've got 30 seconds to communicate to them what you do. So just for a minute, think about your elevator speech. Do you have one down? Is it tight like a tiger that makes people want to know the next step? So my elevator speech right now, or some version of it, is people say, what do you do? And I say, I use neuroscience and state-of-the-art technology to rewire people's brains to get rid of ADHD and anxiety. And they go, really? And I say, yeah. ADHD is caused by too much slow brain speed. That's why they prescribe stimulant medication. 
Anxiety is caused by way too much fast brain speed. That's why it creates spinning of the wheels. We have computer systems that teach the brain how to make more perfect processing speed and less of the slow and the fast. And it gets rid of ADHD and anxiety symptoms. And they go, no way. And I go, way. <laughs> and that's it. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to my website. And I've been making videos. I have videos on YouTube, which is a new thing I've been doing. And, you know, like Melissa said, just start. And I've been making videos and they make me cringe as my children say, oh, every time I make a video, I cringe, but I've been making them anyways. People love them. They're like, I watched all your videos on YouTube. I'm like, you did? But you know, it helps them to understand because the videos are less than two minutes. They're sound bites. So, okay. So you have to talk in sound bites. Now we have brain shift programs. That's what our program is called. It is based on neuroplasticity. So you do not need to know everything about everything about neurofeedback, but you do need to know the little pearl of wisdom, the little piece of communication on how brains work. If you don't know that and you don't know how to communicate it, then you're gonna struggle. And I'm gonna give you three little takeaways right now. You have heard me talk about brain speeds. I stopped talking brain waves. People couldn't envision what a brain wave is. I stopped talking brain waves a long time ago. And I talk about brain processing speeds. And if people know what brain waves are, of course I acknowledge that and, and run with it. But I tell people that our brains have speeds. Our brains are supposed to go extra slow for sleep, a little bit faster. And I, I call this my micro TED talk, which Cosmos keeps asking me to stop calling it that. But I can't because I think it's fun because I don't use any slides and I, ta I talk about how brains work in a very short time frame. Our brains are supposed to use slow speed to shift into sleep. Our brains are supposed to use medium speed when we're just chilling and having a cup of coffee and you're relaxing, but you're not thinking. And then I always joke,